you. Thank you all for coming. My name is Vijesh Chand and I'm the chair person of the JSW School of Public Policy and it's a privilege to welcome Sri N.K. Singh for this talk. May I request Director Professor Errol D'Souza to welcome Sri Singh with a few words. Thank you, Vijay. As Vijay said, it is a privilege, it's an honor to have Mr. N.K. Singh amongst us. He has worn three hats across his career. He has uh, been a bureaucrat and IAS officer. He was the Secretary of Expenditure, Secretary of Revenue, also Secretary of Economic Affairs. And of course, if I'm right, also Secretary to PM uh, at that time, Atal Bihari Vajpayee. Uh, he is also an economist. He's been associated with a number of academic institutions. He was very much with the Nalanda University project, still is. He is with the uh, India Advisory Council of Columbia University and the London School of Economics. Uh, and I visited Tennessee a couple of weeks back. They were remembering him. I didn't realize that one of the chairs there is an IG Patel chair, which I think he initiated. And IG Patel was a former director of our institute. Uh, he's uh, also been the uh, chairman of the Board of Governors of MDI, and uh, he has uh, uh, also, if I recollect, uh, he was also the chairman of the review committee for the FRBM Act, and now, of course, the chairman of the 15th Finance Commission. Uh, welcome to IIM Ahmedabad. It's a pleasure to have you here, and uh, we look forward to your talk on fiscal federalism. A few words about the JSW School of Public Policy. It's the youngest academic unit at this institute. We are still in the process of setting it up. So what we plan to do over the next year or so is to let the academic agenda evolve. Basically research in areas of social policy and public policy, some case studies, and possibly plans for the teaching programs. Now, may I request Jiangshu to just say a few words about the PGPX speaker series, which I'm very happy to say is co-hosting this event. So, Jiangshu, a few words about the speaker series. Thank you, sir. Good evening, everyone. So, it's a it's an honor for us. So, Mr. Sri N.K. Singh is here on campus, and. Uh, I know you are eager to hear him, so I won't take much of time. So just a few words about uh, PGPX. So PGPX actually is a one-year MBA program where uh, we have uh, participants with an average experience of 8.5 years and uh, coming from different backgrounds, different experiences. So it's a, it's a great honor for me to be part of the PGPX batch of 2018 and 19. Coming about uh, speaker series, so sir, we have the privilege of uh, uh, many uh, esteemed speakers on campus. So to name a few, uh, Dr. APJ Abdul Kala, uh, Mr. Uh, Gopi Nathan, uh, Dr. Kiran Bedi, who are few, to name a few. So continuing the same, uh, I think uh, we have uh, Mr. Sri uh, N.K. Singh here, and uh, this talk will inspire us for the same. Thank you very much. So, Thank you, Ajahnamishu. Now, over to Sri and Kese. Uh, how would you like me uh, to speak uh, standing or? Oh, I have already. Feel comfortable. So that's fine. So that's fine. Yeah. Well, I have a call. Okay. So that's fine. So thank you very much, Director, and thank you for this enormous privilege of coming to uh, perhaps the most leading academic institution uh, in the country, one of the most leading academic institutions all over the world. Ahmedabad has set a track record which has done India proud, which has done Indian students proud, and which has done the faculty of this place proud. 
I realized to be here and to the new my association here. I came and lived in the campus for about a week, something years ago, when this campus was being built. It's a past high academic program. So I'm delighted to be here again and to speak on a subject which is a bit prosaic and may not excite the kind of uh, evoke a kind of uh, a, an emotional uh, clasping of the subject and the theme. After all, fiscal federalism doesn't sound really an enormously sexy subject to speak and to travel all of you on a uh, Sunday evening, but I am privileged that uh, really so many of you are, are here uh, for this, uh, what I believe should be hopefully an interactive session. I have written a uh, uh, speech or text or comment, I don't know if picked that one. Uh, I will send it on to you directly if I might for circulating this in some form or the other. Uh, but uh, what I'm going to say is from that, but not necessarily uh, in, in, in exact response. So what does fiscal federalism mean, if I may begin from uh, the basics? And why is it at all relevant in the Indian context to speak of uh, uh, fiscal federalism? And how has fiscal federalism evolved uh, globally speaking? What are the international benchmarks which really define the characteristics of uh, fiscal federalism? And how does India compare itself with that? And what are some of the contemporary challenges which our fiscal federal policy deals with? These are some of the very broad themes which I would like to uh, very quickly cover and then open the door for the but basically, in a certain sense, uh, federalism consists of defining layers of power uh, in between vertical and horizontal division of power, between different layers of government, and to assign financial powers, administrative powers, and to assign the obligations to be able to do so. Federalism, therefore, in sharp contrast to unitary forms of government or quasi-unitary forms of government, or models which are a variation of that. But it is about defining our responsibility between different layers of government. Generally speaking, over a period of time, as democracy has gathered momentum, people have come to believe that the delegation of power to the lower functionaries, who are closer to the people, is in some ways a desirable thing, because they know what is best for the people. And therefore, I think that have encouraged really this kind of a division to take place, moving away from a centrally driven uh, economic pattern and centrally driven uh, uh, social models of economic growth. Now, the United States has practiced this for 200 years. Canada has practiced it for 200 years. Australia is in a bit of a learning curve. And what are some of the commonalities in some of this international experience. How does it compare itself with uh, the Indian experience? I'll come to the Indian experience in a few minutes. So if you look at the, what the US model is, or you look at what the Canadian model is, broadly speaking, functions are defined on what are functions to be performed by the central government or by the union government. And the functions to be defined by the provinces or what in the European Union model comes to the subsidiarity, which really they believe and strongly encourage. So uh, there are subjects which are classified, the classic subjects, I'll come to those, which should be done by the central entity. There are classic subjects which should be done by the provincial entity, or what people call the sub-national government. And it doesn't take too much of a, it's no, no brainer, that the subjects which the central entity is supposed to do foreign policy, uh, defense, uh, macroeconomic stability, uh, overall fiscal policy, uh, overall directions of foreign trade, and subjects which the subsidiary entity is designed to do are areas of education, uh, health, uh, housing, and so on. And this is no-brainer that this is a model which has uh, prevailed all over the world. Now, the one big difference and I'll come to that theme 
little data in, in my intervention, is that if you look at the Australian, Canadian, the US, and the European model is a mixed one because the European Union is a mixture of many nations and some are unitary and some are less unitary. But anyway, the classic veteran ones uh, have a clear demarcation and there's no overlapping. Uh, there is a concurrent list in each one of these models, but in the concurrent list, the legislation passed by the central entity does not override the legislation which is passed by any of the subsidiary entities. Now, this is a very big difference. If you look at the seventh schedule of the Indian Constitution, that theme I will come to a little later. In our case, the central legislation or the legislation enacted by Parliament will override any of the legislations which have been enacted on those subjects by any of the provinces or the sub national now, in the Indian context, when the Constituent Assembly was debating what kind of a model should we have, it was driven quite a bit by uh, two acts. It was driven by the Government of India Act of 1975, which broadly defined the provinces and so on. The 1911 Act earlier had dealt with how the revenues are to be uh, passed, uh, passed out between the states and the center. And the Government of India Act of 1935 broadly defined what are the subjects which the central government should do and what are the subjects which should be done by the provinces. And then also created a third list of what is called the concurrent list in which uh, both the central government and, uh, the, the, uh, and the provinces uh, would really legislate. But the concurrent list itself if you change the character of the concurrent list, requires a constitutional amendment. I mean, you cannot, by an executive order, suddenly legislate, parliament legislate on the subject, which is clearly in the subject matter of uh, subject inside the states. Now, as it evolved, therefore, uh, there were various components of that. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, in the definition of the who should apportion the money and resources which belong to the people of India. Because the assumption is that all revenues, all money, belong to the people of India. That does not belong to the central government. It doesn't belong to the states. It belongs to the people of India. And how should the people, how would the people of India be served very well? In what manner should this money be apportioned? between different entities. So uh, to do this, the constituent assembly when it met, they suggested that you should have an impartial kind of an entity, which should be a constitutional body, which they call the Finance Commission, which is going to, under Article 280 of the Constitution, in which the president is expected every five years, ordinarily speaking, to appoint a finance commission headed by a chair and with four members to go into this division. Now, the first division and the first split which must take place is what is called the vertical division. Vertical between what? Vertical between dividing the entire revenue. And the revenue is defined as really all revenues which are really below minus the cost of collection. The cost of collection is set by, by the control and audit agenda. Give to the X. So the split between the union and the state. So this is the vertical distribution. So that is the first component of the function. The second component of this function is having decided what amount of money should go to the states. Which state should get how much? Illustratively, like for instance, how much should Gujarat get? How much should uh, we all get, how much should uh, U, UP get, and what should be the principles which should define that horizontal distribution. So I first talked about the vertical, then I talked about now the horizontal between, between the states. So these two are central functions. 
And then what happened is under uh, the uh, 73rd Amendment of the Constitution, which came much later, you brought in the third gear of the government. Now, how much money should be given to urban local bodies, uh, and to municipalities, and to panchayats? So these three, of course, this third one come much later, but the first two were part of the original Constitution as enacted in 1952. Now, the first uh, finance commission was an internal commission appointed uh, and led by late C.D. Deshmukh, who gave an internal report to govern the period 49 to 52 when the Constitution was formally adopted. Since 52 now, there have been every periodic thing, there will be block of every five years. Uh, this has this has been done. And what you see today is the 15th Finance Commission, for which uh, uh, I'm, I have to be the chairman and the members. Now, in addition to this, I'll touch on a couple of subjects. What are the mechanisms with the Constitution visualized? Should be the mechanisms of, of coordination between center and states. I mentioned about the finance commission. I'll come to this a little later. But one was an entity called the center state council. The center state council was expected to be the coordinative entity, which would really govern relations between the, the, the central government and the state on all subjects. Membership would be all chief minister. It will preside over the prime minister. It will have a secretariat. Article 263 of the Constitution. It took a long time, it took a Sakarya Commission to keep off the use of that provision of the Constitution, and regrettably, that center state council has remained by and large dysfunctional for reasons uh, which one can go into. But that is one important constitutional entity to bring about the coordination between the center and the states. What's the second one? The second one was, really speaking, an extra constitutional feature, which had no statutory basis, certainly not a constitutional basis, and it had no grounding in any of the key provisions of law, called the Planning Commission. The Planning Commission came to be by an executive order in 1952, following the deliberations of the Planning Committee, and then assumed over a period of time the functions of allocating resources between plan, non-plan, and also making allocations to the states, and then dividing uh, different priorities and so on, and became the principal link mechanism between the center and the state. In fact, as I read to the literature of the past finance commissions, I find in several finance commissions, like the East Finance Commission, which was headed by, made by Vichuhan, the former finance minister, Say, or for instance, the left wing economies of those that guy, the Sixth Finance Commission, you say that as long as an extra constitutional body like the Planning Commission exists, the Finance Commission cannot perform its functions in the same spirit which the Constitution wished for it because a lot of money which they are supposed to allocate is being allocated by the Planning Commission. And so the Finance Commission getting more and more pushed into doing what came to be known as the non-plan, and the planning commission continued to do the plan. But planning commission did emerge as an important link entity between the central government and the states, in addition to the, the center state council. Now, uh, when this government came to office, one of the things it did was that uh, it abolished the planning commission, which then that. Therefore, it also abolished the distinction between the plan and the non-plan. In a sense, therefore, this is the first finance commission that I have, in which I have the total resources which to be able to do the vertical distribution and to do the horizontal distribution, and then to do really the distribution among local bodies and disparity. As I go along, I, what are the principal challenges which uh, my commission or I am going to encounter uh, for the period till I give my report. When I give my report, which is towards the end of next year, in this report, uh, the recommendations of the 
way which it had been treated in the past of 52. It has been treated really like at the war and not a recommendation. Because right from 52, no government has uh, made any change in the basic award. So it has uh, been. So now when I do that, what in the process of consultations uh, are some of the principal challenges uh, that uh, I will be encountering? And what are some of the contradictions which you need to be really concerned? So let me point out to five such challenges and I'll stop. So the first important challenge is, how do I balance equity with efficiency? Uh, for instance, to give an illustrative example, many of you who must be familiar reading the newspapers must have seen that one of the things on which uh, there's a lot of writing, analysis, and, and uh, debate is which population figure, if I have to use a population figure, which population figure should my commission use? Now, I am not the master of that because I am governed by the order of the president, which has ordained that if I use population at all for purposes only of my calculations, I should be really using the population data of the census of 2011. The previous commissions, for a long time, were using the census data for 1972. Uh, so, here's the question. So, uh, many states which have a spectacular record in managing demography better and having population control and following a parliamentary resolution which was passed some years ago, uh, who have managed to contain their population and who between 1972 and 2011 their population has shrunk, certainly not grown that fast and say that if you're going to use the population figure in absolute numbers of 2011 data, we're going to suffer. So why are you hurting me for my good record? So that is performance. Far from rewarding performance, you are hurting performance. Now balance it out. Some states, population has continued to grow, uh, population the replacement rates are still not yet fully grasped. It has come down. In fact, India, for the country as a whole, we have just about now touched the replacement rate, which is a great thing that we are close to the TFR. But anyway, some states, the population has not, uh, has continued to grow. And they say that in spite of our best efforts, given the composition of our population, given the fact that certain communities and so on uh, have a tendency to have a large number of children, given various other factors of a slow start on the social sector changes in education and on health by population growth, why should you like to penalize this people on grounds of equity? Because after all, India being one country, every citizen of India, in a certain technical sense, is entitled, broadly speaking, to the same quality of goods services of life quality as any other citizen in any other part of India. And this really would define, be the basic thing of broad principle of equity. So, on the one hand, performance. On the other hand, equity. And the need to harmonize performance and equity is an important challenge. As indeed, if you look at the terms of reference which I have, with respect to many of governments action program, uh, the need to reward those which have done well, and the need to incentivize others who are yet to catch up, chat poses the same kind of an issue of uh, having to harmonize between the needs of equity with the needs of efficiency. So this is one very important challenge. My second important challenge, and I come back to that is that in the Indian Constitution, anybody who has even personally read it, you know that there is a thing called the seventh schedule of the Constitution. The seventh schedule broadly is what I said earlier. It mirrors what is there in most federations. The seventh schedule has got three lists. 
There is a list, the union list, which is subjects which are direct subjects, the central government to do. There is a state list, which are directly subjects which the state government is expected to do. And it has the concurrent list, which we got, which I talked about. Now, the concurrent list to begin with was very small. And it was more clear between the first list, the union list, and the state list. States are responsible for that list, union government is responsible for their own side. In 1972, there was a big change in the constitution, and the concurrent list got expanded into several, several new subjects. To give an example, education was added to the concurrent list, and other subjects on which the central government had chosen to legislate got added. So now, the conundrum is this. The moment you put a subject in a concurrent list, the obligation on that gets shared between the central government and the states. Think of an example. When education got put in the concurrent list, one of the consequences of that was that Parliament enacted a Right to Education Act, which we know. You put another subject called uh, you know, employment and labor. So you had a Madrega Act, an entitlement driven stock on right to employment as one of the subjects which got put in. So it's become a charge also on the resources of the central government. The central government would say that therefore the finance commission must take these obligations into account before they decide on what is the vertical, namely the central government the union and the states. The states in turn would say that I didn't ask you to put it in the concurrent list. We just had to put it in the concurrent list. But now, in trying to provide enough resources, you are lopping off from resources which ordinarily you would have divided, which would have belonged to us, and which would have divided between us there because their obligation had to be And the problematic thing is that over a period of time, the concurrent list has tended to get expanded. As I told you, much before this government came to power, employment had a separate parliamentary legislation. Education had a separate parliamentary legislation. There is now a very big elephant in the room called the Ayushman Bharat, the health one, on the insurance one. And if that becomes uh, also the concurrent list by moving health, then there is a huge obligation. So what is the future and what is the sanctity or the censorship. And do we need to go to the drawing board to redefine rights and obligations? In what manner? Because that will directly impact the manner in which the, the vertical story is going to be built. And when I begin to look at the calculations, how much is the inescapable liability of the central government? And how much is the inescapable liability of the state government? And one is not a residue of the other. In fact, uh, the suggestion of the Second Finance Commission that the states, what should be given to the state, should be a residue after being the central government was debunked by subsequent funds. The fact remains that this is the money which doesn't belong to the central government. This is the money which doesn't belong to the state government. It belongs to the people of India. And somebody has to do the party job of what would be a fair, reasonable, appropriate, and a balanced distribution of the resources there is where the issue of the future of the concurrent list begins to impact the thing. Third, the third big area I mentioned uh, per se is the extra constitution body called the Planning Commission, which came by the executive order without any uh, parliamentary sanction. Now, a, a type of scheme came up called the centrally sponsored scheme. What is the centrally? These centrally sponsored schemes were typically schemes uh, which were being monitored, financed by the, by the planning commission. Broadly speaking, it's schemes were uh, centrally sponsored, uh, like, for instance, uh, Right to Education, uh, is a centrally sponsored scheme. The cost is shared in a different formula which is the center of the states. Earlier it was 70% uh, by the central government, 30% by the states. 60, 40, etc. So centrally sponsored. 
So centrally sponsored schemes involve resources of the central government, involve resources of the state government. So under the constitution, should you have an expanding list of centrally sponsored schemes? Now the, to the credit of this government, it must be said that they have tried to rationalize these centrally sponsored schemes. The centrally sponsored schemes are now clubbed together following a recommendation of the Shivraj Chauhan Committee report in uh, broad categories of what is uh, optional, what is core of the core, and what are central uh, uh, schemes. But the fact remains that there are still too many central sponsored schemes. And what is the future of this? Should we have these schemes when we already have a seven schedule? How are central sponsored schemes consistent with the original scheme of the constitution of uh, having uh, the seventh shape and what is the path forward in what manner should you recognize not recognize the future of uh, the seventh shape the fourth big issue which is looming large is on the issue of horizontal distribution. Typically speaking, typically speaking, previous finance commissions have looked at three or four uh, major dominant uh, entities to look to the revolution criteria. These three or four dominant, one is population. That's from Lena. Some people say, why population? I myself sometimes ask the question, why population? But the answer is very immediate that uh, population because if the children are born, if the people are there, they need to be looked after. And that casts an obligation on the government, or schools, or hospitals, uh, infrastructure, roads, uh, or public distribution, shops, etc. So population uh, is clearly one thing which has been followed right from 1952. Second, is the area of uh, geographical area. Larger the state, uh, bigger the size, uh, bigger the problems of logistics and transport and the rest of it. And that is also typically being possible. Third, uh, what's been known as the distance criteria. Namely, broadly speaking, the principle of equity. Those states which are at the bottom of the development pyramid were displaced from the average per capita income, average in terms of education, Health, per capita availability of roads, per capita availability of everything, distance from the national average. Uh, yeah, so maybe some loose word if you like uh, equalization. The fourth, which has become a little more, a uh, little more fashionable in the last ten years, is uh, uh, fiscal rectitude. Uh, have they managed their finances well? Uh, are they in conformity with the FRBM Act? Uh, uh, what is their debt, uh, and, and so on and so forth. So a little, little stuff like that. Uh, the fifth, which got added last time, is forest cover. Some have debated it, yes, so and so on. So typically, these are the four or five criteria which are. Are they the best criteria? Uh, you have to naturally take a few. And if they are the best criteria, and there are no better surrogates, then I still have the issue of what weights to assign. Uh, should you assign 20% weight, 10% weight, 15% weight? And is that, in assigning of the weights, is that the challenge of trying to harmonize the issue of equity and efficiency? So uh, that's also, uh, first of all, the choice of the criteria itself, uh, multiplicity of them, and then, of course, the weights to be assigned once you finally the commission uh, decides, decides to say. Let me end by saying that there are many other issues which add to the complexity of my work. I refer to them the fact that uh, planning commission being non-existent, the priorities of the central government expenditure to some extent, therefore, how much they need. The fact that, for instance, uh, Geopolitics of the world is changing. As India plays a more 
important role in an increasingly globally interdependent economy. It's no secret that there are powers in this region which have since achieved high degree of economic growth, who have been and record with it. And India that was struggling to deal with issues of poverty, etc., to some extent has come up with having got a rate of economic growth, uh, which has been quite, uh, quite, in some ways, not spectacular, but quite, quite reasonable. So, in, in, along with increased international interdependence, the geopolitics makes a compelling case that it cannot be ignored for any calculation which any finance commission might want to do on the obligations of the central government. So, at the end of the day, do I know the answers? No. Is my ignorance very large? Yes. Am I wanting to listen? Very much so. Uh, and listen on what? On how to minimize my ignorance and enlarge my knowledge and experience to be able to come up with some credible response on some of these challenges which my commission faces. And I'm, I'll be very keen to hear the people out who are here and to ask questions and thereby enlighten myself a little better and have the feeling and I picked up one of the ideas after the day I had. Thank you very much, Director. Thank you very much. We have about 20 minutes for questions and answers. I would request my chair. Yes, thank you. So, can I ask a first question? What's your question? So, uh, thanks for giving us so many insights about the finance commission. So, um, as I understand, there is lots of data which we need to uh, handle for uh, doing all our policy framework. So, with the uh, advent of big data and new technologies, what do you think, like, uh, going ahead, uh, what would be the future uh, of finance commission? And how, because as you said, there were few competitions, like we were using different census numbers and uh, at different uh, time points. So because of uh, these new technologies, we, we, we would be able to have, we would be having accurate data as those with differences. So uh, how would be the finance commission policy framework like uh, in this time environment? How it would be actually? So uh, sure, we want to use uh, data analytics. Uh, we want to use the, what technology has to offer uh, to our best possible advantage being able to get an analytical econometric framework on a number of cases, regression analysis need to be done. Like for instance, to give an example, what does, uh, I mean, come back to the population issue since you raised that also. You know, one of the things that struck me is that, uh, I mean, in a lighter way, uh, although I'm bound by the order of the president to use uh, 2011, as the, as the principal, principal surrogate for using. And the previous one was 1972. But you know, in a meeting of economists, I asked the question that, that if in the past, as a logic of using population, is that more people mean uh, more resources, etc. Then how about uh, the data not of 2011 but 2021, considering the census data is available every 10 years? So somebody said that uh, 21 data may not be available in 22, and my award is going to hold good from 20 to 25. And somebody said there's enough simulation work which can tell you pretty accurately, or not many things, but pretty accurately on the issue of democracy. So, uh, not that, and so what we are going to want to use analytical data, for instance, on the behavioral pattern of state finances in a significant way. What are, for instance, to give you an example of, on revenue gaps, on debt, on the capturing of contingent liabilities, multiple ways to arrive at a more accurate picture of the data on state finances. Data comes in a lab, and data is sometimes not easy to be able to get. We have permission 
60 studies from various research organizations and entities uh, to be able to precisely get us uh, the best quality of, of the data. To give you an example, measurable performance criteria on uh, several key developer parameters. How do you develop a robust model on what are measurable performance criteria and what kind of implementary model is best designed to arrive at this. And uh, things of that kind, we are into quite a bit of being able to harness uh, what uh, today's technology and data has offered. And any further suggestions of that further, I will get Thank you, sir. Sir, you have given various parameters on which you are supposed to make choices for dispersal of funds. Which one are you in favor of? Yes, you have a mandate from the President of India. Yes, you have a mandate to do justice to everybody. But given population, given uh, states doing well, not doing well, which one would you rather go with? It's a different story whether you go with it or not. Well, I'll naturally go with not I will go with a multidisciplinary. I will go with a hybrid. I will go with a mix. But uh, I haven't made up my mind of which mix. And more than the mix, the weight to be given, or whether I'm going to give a weighted of five percent, ten percent, forty percent, because the past is any guide to the future. The weights which have been assigned by in the last uh, seventy odd years of the finance have varied very significantly on the back. For instance, uh, some finance commissions are given a huge weightage to equalization and to issues of backward. Some others have given to population, and some others are given. So first of all, the surrogates themselves, and then the weights have said, I will go naturally for a hybrid, uh, which are the ingredients of this hybrid not firmly decided, and uh, what's the weight of the hybrid? Less than the <coughs> Sir, if it is equal down and from an ignorant mind. So, uh, why was 1991 census used? Why was 1981 used? In the allocation of the resources. Why was the population census? You mean 71? Ah, after 71, we have 81 data, 91 data, 2001. Brilliant question. Why wasn't that used? Brilliant question. It's not an ignorant question. I was myself wondering why that had happened. <laughs> so, till I was informed by those who were more knowledgeable that Parliament had enacted a parliamentary legislation that, till it is changed otherwise by a specific order, you will use the 1971 census figure. And that was the figure that therefore was given to the finance commission. And what is implicit in that is not only the allocation of resources, where this, this is, becomes important because uh, of population data, but because the delimitation of parliamentary constituencies, that, which is also based on recruitment population, was frozen by parliament some years ago. Till 19, uh, till a renewal in 25, and till 1930. So the worry is, in the minds of some people, not only on what they will gain or lose by way on the population, but whether in some ways the worry is this will affect really the, the, the delimitation issue and the number of parliamentary and assembly constituencies that they have. But the fact remains from our point of view, we have no choice. We have to obey the orders of the president, which has constituted the commission and which has given his task to the president. We can change the mix. We can change the mixture. I'd like to give you an example. The 14th Finance Commission, which is the Finance Commission of 2004, they were asked to use the, the data of uh, 1971. So they, what they did was they obeyed that order of giving 17 points to the 71 data, but 10 points to the population data of 2011. So they chose a mix. But then they chose 
to give 27 percent in some form or the other to the population issue. So other commissions, uh, present for the future one, may, may not, may choose a higher one, but they chose a mix. A mix was really in some ways an interpretation of theirs to the order of the president uh, asking them to do a particular one. So, so that is the latitude uh, which a commission have, but we are bound by the notification of the president. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for coming here. And once again, I welcome you. So, sir, let me introduce myself. I am Abhishek Chha. I am from Purnia, Bihar. The constituency of your mother and land of your grandfather. So, my sort of question is that, uh, as the Bihar also and also other states, there is a lot of fight regarding the special category status or the grant given to them. The question is, where is the finance uh, commission fitting in this? Now, how do you manage this economic versus political and how do you take and advise the government regarding this? What should be done and how it should be done? Since you come from Pune, you would tolerate an answer in English. Don't expect me to give you an answer in Mexican. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Uh, so anyway, uh, let me say this. That the reason why I'm somewhat embarrassed, somewhat embarrassed, to uh, answer that question. And uh, is this, that I was a member of parliament for representing the city of the house, six years in the upper house. One of the things I championed at that time was to accord a special category status to the heart. Okay? So that was in a different hat. Uh, and I don't know what I did and what I didn't. That is in the past. As far as the present is concerned, I am bound only by two things. I am bound by the Constitution and by my conscience. Now, in terms of reference of this finance commission, does not enjoin upon me to consider the issue of special categories. I will abstain from pronouncing on subjects which are not part of my event. What do I mean by that? You know, you must have seen this huge controversy that the Andhra Pradesh pulled out as an allied partner of the central government on the ground that the special category state has not been given. In fact, ironically speaking, uh, I was present in Parliament on the day when the Andhra Pradesh reorganization bill came up for approval with the upper house of parliament. And it is a fact that such was the pressure of the previous government to want to pass this bill that the then prime minister got up and said, I will give an accord, a special category status to the state of Andhra Pradesh. Now, the grievance of uh, uh, Chief Minister of Andhra is that, that that commitment solemnly made in Parliament was not honored and needs to be really honored. The counter to that, of course, is that who made the commitment and who should have honored it? The, the President of the argue that you should go back to the person who made the commitment. To that, of course, the counter is governments are in continuity, they are in perpetuity. And of course, the final reply on that is that the previous commission, previous to my commission, in dealing with this Andhra issue, not exactly the Andhra issue, but this issue of special category status, did say that we do not recognize categorization of states into different entities because we will and we are.